Lately, the idea that West is entering in its decline phase has become somewhat popular. The long-standing idea about technological progress suggests that we can completely emancipate ourselves from the shackles of medieval dark ages. In this video, we will argue that technology itself not only is not able to overcome the dark ages, but it actually acts as its Trojan horse. Before delving into the question, it's crucial to lay the groundwork by defining the concept of the Dark Ages itself. In popular discourse, Dark Ages describes a period marked by a lack of cultural and intellectual development. But does this formulation give justice to the period it signifies? Does not the characterization provide a rather limited and narrow perspective on the intricacies of the medieval age? First, we will attempt to provide a more accurate conception of what Dark Ages amounts to, and then we are going to see whether it awaits us in the future. Let's remember that the medieval period derives its reputation as the Dark Ages thanks to Enlightenment, which defines itself in contradistinction to the latter. Hence, explicating the essence of the Dark Ages necessitates contrasting it with its successor, that is, the Age of Reason. As we already mentioned, our conception of the Middle Ages is shaped by Enlightenment. But the same is true when it comes to Enlightenment itself, meaning a common definition of Enlightenment suggests that it is an age of reason, entailing an attempt to elevate humanity from ignorance to reason and rationality. However, what if the reverse is the case, namely that Enlightenment is merely a popularization of reason and rationality? which means not elevating people to truth, but rather dumping it down to the level of the masses. And we can provide three main arguments to back up this claim. Well, first, most people who pledge allegiance to science well, don't actually understand it. Secondly, uh, the other side is vehemently anti-scientific, evidenced by the rise of climate change denial, flat earth society, and denial of human evolution. And the third, most atheists and self-described rationalists still base their moral worldview and seek spiritual fulfillment in sources other than reason. I think such an outcome was actually inevitable, since mass enlightenment proceeded to monopolize common sense and hence created popular philosophical and scientific rhetoric instead of actually engaging with reason. Note that rationality as common sense is no longer rationality, since the latter always transcends and therefore challenges common sense. Therefore, we get to one of the most essential elements of what constitutes the Dark Ages, namely that reason and rationality are confined to the absolute minority, represented in medieval times by the clergy. The enormous knowledge produced in the Middle Ages was simply inaccessible to the masses, locked up within the libraries of monasteries, both literally and metaphorically. Now it's worth mentioning that this was partly determined due to the level of literacy which radically dropped in medieval times. We as children of enlightenment often take literacy for granted and as a consequence underestimate its enormous effect on our worldview. If one compares preliterate modes of thought to the literate, it will immediately become evident how much literacy changes our conception of reality. Yes, and we can look at the example of ancient Greece, since the transition from pre-literate mode of thought to literate is most clear and easily traced there. As we all know, ancient Greece is a place where Western philosophy was born, and one may even say the sciences in general. But it is noteworthy that it was born in a very particular social-cultural condition, namely in opposition to traditional poetry, which has been the heart and soul, core of ancient Greek civilization for many centuries. But this conflict is not a mere antagonism between different arts, i.e. poetry and philosophy, but rather a conflict between two fundamentally opposing modes of thought. A poetic mode of thought is based on a passive reception of opinions through powerful impressions, while a philosophic, literate mode of thought is based on active, synthetic engagement with opinions, questioning and dialectical ascent towards truth. Therefore, the main reason why philosophical inquiry is carried out in a dialogical fashion is precisely because it prioritizes active, synthetic engagement. On the other hand, poetic oration is monological and emotionally charged. Now, I think it would be helpful if you explained what the synthetic engagement actually means. Of course, 
Zetetic engagement becomes most obvious and most evident when compared with, for example, uh, traditions that are based on revelation, which take for granted the fundamental truths and opinions that are granted by certain tradition. Okay, so zetetic engagement then would be a skeptical questioning mode uh, yes, type of yes, engagement. Okay. Yes. Socratic. Basically. Okay. In philosophy, then, Ebo mentioned clash between pre-literate oral paradigm against the literate philosophical mode of thought is understood as a triumph of being that is abstract, static, and immutable, or becoming that is an eternal flux, change, and intuitive dynamism. In short, literate mode of thought prioritizes being over becoming, and hence Plato triumphs over Homeric flow of poetry and Heraclitian river. Also consider that this inaccessibility of knowledge does not just reflect the material conditions of the Middle Ages, but rather a prevailing philosophical attitude towards the immutability of natural order. If enlightenment was characterized by the optimistic belief in the perfectibility of human nature, then pre-enlightenment paradigm had a somewhat fatalistic stance in this matter. For pre-modern thinkers, there is an obvious inequality regarding the natural gifts and talents of man. The absolute majority of men lack the nature fit for reasonable inquiry, and since the natural order of things is not subject to change and human interference, this inequality can never be overcome. Hence, the solution for pre-moderns consists not in the universal education of humankind, but rather in defending the latter from the corrupting property of reason. Now, in the second part of our video, we will go into more details as to how the above-mentioned philosophical points are relevant to the current age. As we have mentioned, one of the principal elements that defines the Dark Ages is the inaccessibility of knowledge to the masses. This is evidenced by the fact that in the first two centuries of printing by movable types, was motivated much more by the desire to see ancient and medieval books than by the need to read and write new ones. Until the 17th century, more than 50% of all printed books were ancient or medieval. Emergence of the printing press shone light to the preceding Dark Ages. Hence, the ability to read was disenchanted, since in the past it was conceived as a magical power, accessible to secret societies who engaged in bibliophilic endeavors. Therefore, it logically follows that magic available to everyone is no longer dark but bright, losing its esoteric flavor. Now, there are three main characteristics that evidence the coming of the Dark Ages. First, the triumph of light through over light on paradigm. Second, oral over visual paradigm. And the third, generalism over specialism. First, the digital revolution retrieves the light through paradigm of dark ages and does away with the light on paradigm of enlightenment. This also sheds light on why the medieval period was conceived as dark by enlightenment thinkers. The parallel between Gothic aesthetics and modern electronic paradigm is striking. Gothic cathedrals and illuminated manuscripts were self-radiant and tactile. The light of the sun going through the stained glass symbolizes the divine revelation coming from the heavens. And note how we contrasted the zetetic engagement of Athenian paradigm to the mode of revelation of the biblical paradigm. Now, in the age of the printing press, where private and isolated engagement became possible, the light on paradigm prevailed, where emphasis shifts from self-radiance divinity to a black and white abstract Euclidean piece of paper. Electronic revolution retrieves the light through paradigm by virtue of self-radiant iPads, computers and TVs. The resemblance of scribal culture with comic strips and electronic paradigm lies in its fact that they are both participatory. That is, you need to engage with the given material and fill in the gaps. Now, since you mentioned participation, the example of scholastic education would be most noteworthy here, since it was of an interactive type. A lecturer would always read manuscripts out loud, where students participated in translation, editing and production of those texts. Gutenberg's revolution and reformation fostered a private engagement with texts along with silent reading which is only possible with printed material. Electronic Epoch retrieved seminars and group discussions, evidencing a shift to oral as opposed to visual illiterate paradigm. 
Note how the triumph of literate being over pre-literate becoming is played out in the history of Western society. Now this brings us to an oral-visual dichotomy. Orality is instantaneous and acoustic, since the ear, which is the organ of the Dark Ages, perceives the world from all around, creating a sense of acoustic space, as opposed to flat, horizontal visual space. On the other hand, the visual paradigm brought forth by the printing press using abstract phonetic alphabet that is detached from the everyday world is uniform, continuous, and linear. Visual space fostered by the light-on paradigm is conceived as a detached container that is filled by actions and objects. Hence, in the Renaissance art, you have objects situated within a shared visual geometrical space, as opposed to Byzantine one, where each object carves out its own space, and hence is enmeshed in the golden background of the enclosed space. Hence, we arrive at an opposition between typographic, linearly thinking person who can act without reacting, and a temperamental, tribal, acoustic person who is retrieved by the global village of an electronic technology. Mass stimulation and ADHD of modern, densely populated electronic cities encircle and bombard us with information from all around, substituting a detached, static observer with a mobile, participating subject who has to apprehend multiple disconnected sources of information simultaneously. Hence, the shift from light on to light through and from abstractly visual to acoustic retrieved the mass dyslexia and illiteracy of the Dark Ages. It is no coincidence that the advent of TV primarily affected males. Dyslexia ratio was 9 to 1, evidencing a shift from typographic, masculine left brain mode of thought to acoustic, kinesthetic, and holistic right hemisphere mode of thought. And the third point regards the triumph of generalism over specialism. The Enlightenment paradigm consists in radical self-taming and inhibition through strict education, where schools and universities force people to conform to mechanical activity, subjugating the body, controlling your eyes and following the rules of the printed pages. Such disciplinary society fosters extreme segmentation of human affairs. Such self-taming leads to a release of emotions through nationalism and conquest, which characterizes the colonialism of age of reason, both metaphorically and literally. Electronic paradigm brings down walls and creates a worldwide acoustic electronic village, where aggression becomes tribal and personal, evidenced by cyber balkanization of social media. Now people are free to release their emotions without much self-control. Hence, like in the Dark Ages, the modern electronic paradigm retrieves synthetic and multidisciplinary thinkers who are generalists and have exhaustive accounts of the world. This breaks down linear and sequential trains of thought and favors conspiratorial thinkers who explain politics by pointing to how everything is under control by the elite. Now, total surveillance of the internet that retrieves the eye of the god characteristic of dark ages manufactures an uncritical recipient of orders that can be controlled to a massive degree. Now, to sum up our video, uh, we can discern three main facts that support the idea that we are, in fact, entering into dark ages. Well, actually, by we, we mean you, uh, since we are already at home uh, when it comes to dark ages. So the first fact is that if in dark ages, knowledge and reason was inaccessible to the masses, now because of the information overload and electronic technology, the majority of people are no longer educated. Secondly, primary mode of communication shifts from writing that is linear and abstract medium to oral and acoustic that is discontinuous, instantaneous and emotionally stimulating medium. And the third, majority of people are no longer subject to self-inhibiting forces that retrieve the temperamental, charismatic, generalist personalities. And finally, it is worth noting that the dark ages that is digital age does not represent a form of apocalypse, but rather a general human condition. Hence, it mostly affects the general public, since the intellectual elite in all preceding ages retained a somewhat bibliophilic attitude. Hence, the lifestyle of intellectuals did not experience much change in terms of the form and structure. What is different, though, is the condition of an average citizen, which is and always will be the subject of every sociopolitical enterprise.
Gates ever call you on the phone and say, <laughs> hey, Yuval, what do you think of this? Maybe he calls Itzik because I don't have a phone. <laughs> so, but uh, as far as I know, no, uh, he hasn't called us yet. You, you don't have a phone? Uh, no, not, not a smartphone. I have a landline. 